Hey everyone, it's Joe. Welcome to week three of PC Neurobiology with our online format. I'm very excited about this week because we're going to talk about the two proteins that I spent my entire career studying, the amyloid precursor protein and kinesin. The first paper we're going to look at is by Kamal et al. titled, Axonal Transport of Amyloid Precursor Protein is Mediated by Direct Binding to the Kinesin Light Chain Subunit of Kinesin 1. And what this paper suggests is that the amyloid precursor protein may serve as a trailer hitch to link kinesin to its cargo, the vesicle. And that's interesting for two reasons. First of all, we've said many times that there's no known function for amyloid precursor protein. And this paper assigns a function to APP, and it also implicates kinesin in Alzheimer's disease. So how great would that be if that turns out to be true? Before we look at the paper, let me just draw the conclusion or a schematic of the conclusion, and then we'll talk about the data. So we've drawn this before, but here's a vesicle with its lipid bilayer. Oops, sorry. And we have the amyloid precursor protein with its transmembrane domain and the C-terminal. So this is the C-terminal. This is, of course, the N-terminal. And the paper suggests that APP is bound to the kinesin light chain, which I'm going to get to in a minute. But you guys will recall that the heavy chain is a homodimer, that it has this tail and then this globular domain that they call a head instead of a tail. I mean, instead of a instead of a foot, and the kinesin is bound to the microtubule. This is the plus end of the microtubule, and this is the minus end of the microtubule, so this is the microtubule. And the kinesin hydrolyzes ATP, and that allows the molecule to generate force and to walk one after another along the road, along the microtubule. So this is kinesin, heavy chain. And then this is APP. And the light chain, I'm just going to draw it schematically, just so we, it doesn't look like this, but I'm just going to draw it as a circle. The kinesin light chain binds to the heavy chain at the tail. And the paper suggests that APP binds to the tail and forms the link between the kinesin molecule and the vesicle cargo. And that's how kinesin then moves the cargo down the track towards the plus end. Okay, let's talk about the data. Really, the only thing that I want to talk about is figure one, because the data in that figure summarizes the concept that we just drew on the, uh, on the tablet. If you don't have a copy of the paper in front of you, please go get it so that we can go through this figure together. As I mentioned, the figure that I want to concentrate on is figure one, which is on page 450 of the journal or page two of the article. In this figure, the data represents something called an immunoprecipitation experiment, and I'm going to talk about that. But first, they used two different samples. They're looking at mouse, and they looked at tissue from the brain, as well as the sciatic nerve. So they're both neuronal tissues. It turns out the data for the sciatic nerve is the same, or very similar, and it's the same result as for the brain. So I want to put the sciatic nerve data aside and just focus on panel A, for the brain, which is on the left-hand side. So let's talk about immunoprecipitation. We've talked many times about how antibodies are made, but just to review that, you first need the antigen, that is the protein or the substance that you want to make an antibody against, In, for example, amyloid precursor protein, and you could biochemically purify APP from an organism from brain tissue, for instance, 
or we said that you could take the coding sequence for amyloid precursor protein and insert the coding sequence into bacteria and turn the gene on in the bacteria and make a recombinant form of amyloid precursor protein. So it's, it's maybe human amyloid precursor protein, but it's made in bacteria. The final way you can make an antibody is just to look at the sequence and find a region that has some side chains, the amino acid side chains that look like they might cause an immune response, and inject, synthesize a 20 amino acid stretch or so, and inject that peptide into the host. And those are the three ways that you can generate an, an antigen, and then the antigen gets injected into the host, and the host obviously recognizes that as foreign, and it builds antibodies Against uh, against that particular molecule, and of course the the let's see if I can get my pen to work. The antibodies we said are shaped like a Y, and most of the antibody is the conserved domain, so it's identical. Uh, but different antibodies have a different variable domain, and the variable domain is found at the tip, and that's the part that binds specifically to the antigen, whether it's APP or some, an antibody raised against some other type of molecule. So in an immunoprecipitation experiment, what they do is they take the tissue, in this case we said that it's brain, and from mouse, and this is biochemistry. So you got to make yourself a mouse brain milkshake, and if you grind it up and then put it in a test tube and you centrifuge the tube, of course you will get a pellet and you will get a supernatant. And in the supernatant are the soluble proteins. We talked about this as well. And if you take the supernatant now and you put it in a new test tube, then you just have molecules that are dissolved and they're free in solution, like so. So in immunoprecipitation, what they do is they take some sort of bead, sometimes they're glass, sometimes they're magnetic, and they incubate the bead with the antibody. And the antibody binds to the bead through a charged interaction. So now you have this bead that's completely coated with the antibody. And they incubate the beads now with the antibody attached with the supernatant. So you have beads and you have the little antibodies attached like so. And now the antibody, of course, is going to bind to the antigen. So, for instance, it might bind to amyloid precursor protein. So, we have our test tube. We have our bead with an antibody on it. And now, it's bound to APP. Now there's still, of course, lots of stuff dissolved into the liquid. But now if you spin this down, then put this in a centrifuge, the beads are really heavy because they're, they're much, much larger than the antibodies. And so what we get is our glass beads or magnetic beads, whatever they are down here with the antibody attached and now amyloid precursor protein attached like that. And the idea is that if you pull down, that's what they call this, that you pull down APP, you're also going to pull down anything that APP is attached to.
right? I mean, if two things are bound and you're grabbing the APP, then you can um, you can pull down whatever attaches to APP, like potentially kinesin. Okay, and then you wash this stuff and you get rid of all of the all of the dissolved things that were here and you just end up with squeaky clean beads with whatever is attached to through the through the antibody and then you run this part this pellet right here on a protein gel so you add the beads to a test tube and you put in um, some some gel buffer and that takes everything apart so it breaks all of the bonds the bond between the antibody and the APP between the APP and the kinesin and you run the gel so let me draw that part hold on one sec okay so now if we run our gel of course the gel has many lanes, I mean about 10 or so, um, and the wells, in the wells you load the different amino precipitations that they did. And so they didn't just pull down with APP, for instance, they pulled down with kinesin and kinesin light chain and some others. So they did multiple experiments. And in lane four, they did the APP, so I'm going to draw that in here. And if you pull down with APP, then, of course, you're going to get a banding pattern as you run the gel, the electricity in this direction, but they're invisible because they're not stained. So the banding pattern exists, but you can't see it. And then they they're doing a Western blot here, so they transfer the proteins from the gel onto nitrocellulose, which is just essentially paper. And now you have this piece of paper with a banding pattern on it. And over here, they have APP. This was the APP pull down. So they used APP on the beads. The beads pulled down the APP. Then they run whatever came down in the immune precipitation, so APP and whatever APP binds to, and that ends up in this lane as an invisible banding pattern. And then they add an antibody to do the Western blot. And one of the antibodies that they use, and they use multiple antibodies, is they use an antibody against APP. So you have anti-APP. And it makes sense that if you use an APP antibody to pull down APP and then you run that sample on the gel and transfer it to a piece of paper and then you add the primary antibody, the primary antibody binds, and then you have a secondary antibody here that binds to the first and is conjugated to something that changes color, for instance, you will end up, let me just erase this, what I put here. you will end up with a beautiful purple, oops, sorry, band. That's APP. If you pull down with APP, you run it on a gel, and then you probe it with an APP antibody, it will give you a nice band because as expected, APP was indeed pulled down by the APP antibody. And then in the figure, what they like to do is they take their scissors, and since all of this part of the gel doesn't matter, there's nothing there, I'm sorry, the nitrocellulose, then they just take their scissors, they cut this piece out like this, and then they make that part of their figure. So they have a slice of the, the Western blot, and they have their... APP right here. So they pull down with APP and they get APP. That part's not so surprising, right? I mean, obviously, 
that should happen. Um, but it turns out, as I said, they did multiple experiments, so I want to go through each experiment and try to analyze this data. And the very first lane is called no antibody, which of course is a negative control, because if you don't have an antibody on the bead, nothing should be pulled down. So the very first lane that you look at in the figure on the far uh, left says no AB. And you'll see that there's absolutely no band in any of the Western blots that were done with the different antibodies for the Western. The next lane over is called 6390. 63, let's see if I can write it in here, 63. 90. And that is kinesin light chain. Okay? It's just a wacky nomenclature that relates back to um, the discovery of that protein. So this is an antibody against the kinesin light chain. And it turns out that they do a pull down. They do a western blot a pull down in a western blot with the light chain antibody, and then they probe it with the same antibody again, 6390, which is the light chain. And if you pull down with the light chain antibody and then you test it with the light chain antibody, you would expect to get a band. And actually, they get two, because there's two different forms of the light chain in the sample. So if you pull down kinesin light chain, you have the kinesin light chain antibody to the beads. The beads are added to the supernatant. It binds to any light chain that's in the soup. And then when you pellet it, you pellet the light chain. And it's not surprising that they got a positive reaction for the light chain. Now, if you look at APP, that's the second Western blot. Indeed, they also get a band for APP. So what this suggests is that if you pull down with a kinesin light chain antibody, you also pull down APP. So the kinesin light chain must be bound to the amyloid precursor protein. And that's their discovery. That's the main discovery of the paper. Now they also use an antibody called KIF-5B, KIF-5B, which is the kinesin heavy chain antibody, or the kinesin, yeah, the kinesin heavy chain antibody. And then they ask whether they pull down the light chain. And indeed, they pull down the light chain, both of them. And then they ask whether they pull down APP. And they pull down APP. Whoops, that's a little low. Let me try again. So, if you pull down the kinesin heavy chain and then you probe it for the light chain, you get the light chain. So the light chain is bound to the heavy chain. Then if you probe that same sample for APP, you get APP. So if you pull down kinesin heavy chain, you also pull down the light chain and amyloid precursor protein. So that suggests that all three of those proteins are bound to one another. You have the kinesin heavy chain. You have the kinesin light chain. And you have amyloid precursor protein. What they did is they pulled down with the kinesin heavy chain. And they say, they ask, do you also pull down the light chain? And the answer to that is yes, it's right here. And do you also get 
APP, does that also get pulled down? Yes. And that suggests that those three molecules are all attached to one another. Okay, they do one more control, which is a negative control for a protein called synaptotagmin. And synaptotagmin does not bind to APP or kinesin. So if they pull down the synaptotagmin, they get synaptotagmin. And if they pull down the synaptotagmin, they don't get the light chain and they don't get APP. So that worked out well. And if you pull down with APP, you don't get synaptotagmin. If you pull down with a kinesin heavy chain, you don't get synaptotagmin. And if you pull down with a light chain, you don't get synaptotagmin. And if you don't use an antibody at all in the pull down, of course, you don't get synaptotagmin. So that's a very nice control. But it turns out that there's something that's left out of this paper. And that was confusing to me. They left out a Western blot where they probed the blot for kinesin heavy chain. And that's important because if what you're telling me is that if you pull down for with the kinesin heavy chain that you get the light chain and you get amyloid precursor protein because they're bound to one another. All three are bound to one another. That's the only way the pull down works. You pull down with a heavy chain and when you pull the heavy chain down you also get the light chain and you also get amyloid precursor protein, right? So that's what they're saying in this lane. You pull down with a heavy chain, you get the light chain and you get APP. But they don't show that they get the heavy chain. They should show that and they, they have the reagents to do it. And so I know they did the experiment. They had to have done it. That would have been the best outcome. So you'd say, if you pull down with APP, you get the light chain, you get APP, of course, and then you get the heavy chain. And if you pull down with the light chain, you get the light chain, you get APP, and you get the heavy chain. But they didn't show this. And the only reason that they wouldn't show it is because it didn't work. Okay, guys, that's it for today. We have a really interesting paper tomorrow to follow up on today's discussion by Lazaroff et al., and then we have a paper that came out of my lab at PC on Friday. Talk to you then. Bye-bye.